In a chilling tale that unfolded in the quiet corners of Fairfax County, Virginia, Richard Lee Whitley, an unsuspecting part-time painter and handyman, met a shocking fate. The wheels of justice turned swiftly as Whitley faced the wrath of the electric chair on that fateful day, July 6, 1987. His conviction, handed down on May 13, 1981, revealed the grisly details of a crime that shook the community to its core. Phoebe Parsons, a 63-year-old widow residing in the peaceful Pimmett Hills neighborhood, fell victim to Whitley's rampage on July 25, 1980. The prosecutor, Robert Horan Jr., described the slaying as unbelievably brutal, leaving no doubt about the heinous nature of the act. As the trial unfolded, the community grappled with the darkness that had infiltrated their once serene surroundings. In a telephone interview with a Richmond television station, Whitley said he was ready to die. I know they're going to kill me. He said he would have liked to have had the execution televised and to be put to death without a hood over his head to let the people see exactly what facial expressions you have when they put the juice to you. Richard Lee Whitley's execution marked a significant milestone in the landscape of capital punishment. As the sixth person to be executed in the state of Virginia since the Supreme Court reinstated the death penalty in 1978, Whitley became a somber addition to the national tally, bringing the total number of executions in the country to 81. Let's hear the proceedings of his execution. One, two, three. It was peaceful here for them. Uh, yeah. yeah, they just grabbed him. He went down to the ground. Gina, they, Captain, thank the man ahead. Oh, yeah. You're not using a blank tape? No. I think still got him. Mr. Lawhorn? Yes. Okay. Have you got the recorder on? Yes, I do. Yes, it's on. Go. The witnesses are still filing in. They're being signed in and seated. Mr. Perry, am I still on the speakerphone? Yes, you are. Yes, sir. Okay, the witnesses are now being briefed. They're all seated. The equipment is now being tested. The testing of the equipment is now complete. I repeat, the testing of the equipment is now complete. We copy. 1051. We copy. Test now complete. Okay, this is the one there upstairs. I've got Lonnie on the other side. I just want to make sure that you are here. Okay, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he's on ESP number 80. I'm going to put him on. He's ready to go back. I'm going to show him up there. See, Lonnie's outside the government's office with the radio communication here in case there's something on the telephone. They haven't done anything yet? No. Once they get him in there, they think they're all set up there. They look right at that one the top before they see them. They don't have to wait.
I'm going to put the phone down on the speaker phone and then I'll bring it back up. Okay. The order has been read. Did you hear anything? Are there any comments or last remarks? None. Charge applied. It's level two. Second charge has been applied. Second charge has been applied. Dr. Davis is now examining the inmate with me. The doctor has given the word that inmate Whitley has expired. Inmate Whitley has expired at 11.07 for Dr. Davis. Witnesses are now leaving. Witnesses are now leaving. It's 1107. In a moment that reverberated with both tragedy and moral conflict, the execution of murderer Richard Lee Whitley left an indelible mark on Timothy Kane, his own defense attorney. It wasn't a question of Whitley's guilt, his criminal history and confession to the brutal 1980 murder and sexual assault of his elderly neighbor in Fairfax County left no room for doubt. Yet, as the state sent 2,500 volts coursing through Whitley's body, Kane, carrying a Bible, emerged from the prison to confront the media. The young lawyer's pain was palpable. It wasn't solely the execution of a brain-damaged man, someone who may not have fully grasped the gravity of his actions, that troubled Cain the most. In that moment, Cain bared his soul to the television cameras, offering a prayer for a society that would administer such a punishment. What gnawed at his conscience was a deeper concern, an unease about a system that, even in the face of a crime as heinous as Whitley's, would resort to extinguishing a life. The execution had not only claimed Whitley's existence but had left a piece of compassion and humanity within Cain diminished as well. 
Kane's unwavering commitment to Whitley led to a grueling two-year legal battle, navigating multiple courts that often resulted in frustrating outcomes. In the final 48 hours, three courts rejected Kane's efforts, and Governor Gerald L. Belilez denied sentence commutation. Ultimately, the U.S. Supreme Court's denial, just four hours before the execution, sealed Whitley's fate. In that moment, Kane's arduous odyssey through the corridors of justice reached its painful conclusion, leaving him to grapple with the profound sense of defeat and the lingering question of whether he had done enough to alter the course of fate. His crime was a terrible crime. It was a tragedy. I don't have any doubt about that. For somebody who has a view like mine about life, the pain is a very real thing. Something personal in me will die, too. There are a lot of little deaths in that way every day. It's been hard. It's been hard, these setbacks. It's hard to keep going back and giving bad news to your client. As the end drew near, Timothy Kane's optimism waned after dedicating nearly 1,000 hours of pro bono legal work to Whitley's case. With Kane's legal career still in its early stages, Whitley's presence had loomed large, taking a toll on him psychologically, as lawyer Dennis Balsk observed the traumatic demands of a capital case. Dennis Balsk, a legal director of the Southern Poverty Law Center and a lawyer in Montgomery, Alabama who represented clients in capital cases said, It's even more psychologically draining to be coming down to the execution wire trying to save your client's life. It's a very frustrating experience. So much so that it's almost impossible to get lawyers who have done it to do it again. Everyone is mad at you. The judges are mad at you. The public is mad at you. The attorney general is mad at you. Everybody feels that you are the bad guy. David E. Boone, a local lawyer, who defended nine clients in death penalty cases said, A capital case is not just another case. It's a different animal. You're pretty much devoting your life. I don't care about money, I don't care about the time spent when I take the case. I become totally devoted to that client. I don't even know what day it is. He might be the worst person in the world and you might despise him, but by God, when you take his case, you take his life on your shoulders. When Timothy Kane, a Kansas City native, settled in a new city with his lawyer wife, he sought the American Civil Liberties Union to lend a hand. Little did he know that his willingness to assist with post-trial constitutional matters would thrust him into the role of Richard Lee Whitley's sole attorney. Despite specializing in civil cases, Kane embraced the opportunity fueled by his firm opposition to capital punishment. That opposition stems, he said, from my fundamental belief about life. There's a lot of pain and suffering and evil everywhere in the world, and capital punishment is one example of it. The principal injustice in the death penalty in Virginia, he said, is that nobody, as far as I know, is on death row in Virginia who had enough money to pay an attorney. If you had enough money to pay an attorney like David Boone, you're not going to get the death penalty. Kane said he did not wish to criticize Whitley's original trial lawyers, but, in Whitley's case, his court-appointed attorneys never investigated his background. They didn't know that he had been diagnosed as completely clinically incompetent when he was an adolescent. They didn't know that he had a long history of childhood head injuries, that he had organic brain damage, that he had psychiatric disorders, that he had a borderline retarded IQ. They didn't know his childhood was about the worst possible childhood that anyone could ever imagine. All of that stuff, in my mind, is critically relevant to a jury in terms of what they might want to do, the difference between life and death frequently weighs on exactly those factors. I think it's a tragedy to execute somebody who had the kind of background that he has had. His crime was a tragic crime, but executing him would only compound that tragedy. He has to know that there is at least one person out there who really fought for him. There's something therapeutic in that, even for somebody who is going to be executed. 
Whitley's story stands as a poignant testament to the gravity and far-reaching implications of the decisions made within the realm of life and death. It serves as a powerful reminder of the profound consequences and moral responsibilities inherent in the administration of justice.